Welcome to Miss Poppins' The Art of Parenting, a podcast dedicated to creating a supportive community for new parents. I'm your host, Nikki Rishi, and today we have a special episode focusing on child development. Join me as an incredible woman shares a passion for supporting moms on their child's development journey. Laura, a child development specialist with over 12 years of experience, has adapted to virtual support since the pandemic and offers comprehensive guidance in areas like speech, feeding, sensory issues, and many more. With a deep passion for child development and supporting parents, she's here to share valuable insights on navigating parenthood and enhancing child's growth. Tune in for expert tips and strategies for family success. Let's dive into our conversation with Laura to learn more. Welcome, Laura. So glad you are here with us today for our episode. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Let's get right into our questions. The first uh, key one, how do different types of toys influence a child's cognitive, physical, and emotional development? Let's talk about those different milestones. Can you maybe help us understand the impact of toy selection on growing minds? Yeah, so one of the things that we've run into a lot of times is families will have a toy for a lot longer than the child developmentally needs it, or they have toys that don't match the cognitive ability or the speech language skill that the child is maybe achieving in their milestones or where they should be going next. So families that don't have like a good toy rotation, uh, making sure that their toys are not gonna be thoroughly gone through on a regular basis, as well as making sure that okay, they've mastered this toy, maybe we should put it up. If we're going to plan on having any other children, keep it for later, maybe (laughs) give it to a donation, uh, depending on your family planning, right? I'm I'm curious about the concept of mastering toys, right? Like we do see the concept of Montessori or, you know, the rotation concept. Mm -hmm. Don't have too many choices up front because they'll get bored with it. So now after a couple of weeks, they are engaged again with the toy. So how do you define mastering? And when do you know it's time to move on versus they're just bored, they know it, but then in two weeks, they'll be excited to see it again and they'll be engaged. Uh, is there a difference between the two? Yeah, so there's a really clear difference. Obviously, for those of us who have studied it, we kind of know that really, really quickly, but moms and dads and caregivers can start to notice that a child has mastered a skill when it's really boring to them. So when something's challenging and they're learning how to do a toy, for instance, like a ball drop, They have the ball drop toy, the child's clutching the toy, they're trying to put it into the hole, they can't, they're missing. There's a lot of these cognitive processes, fine motor processes, just gross motor processes, language development that's happening while they're trying to figure it out. Once your child can pick up that ball, look at it, put it perfectly into that ball drop, retrieve it and repeat it, they've mastered it. They've actually outgrown it. And so one of my huge tips is give your kiddos toys about six months ahead of when you think or when they're supposed to have mastered it. So that's a really big tip. And a lot of people will actually give a child like a puzzle when they are going to master it in about two weeks. And then they're like, Mm. oh, they're bored with this puzzle. They don't really play with it very much. It's because it's no longer challenging. It's really easy to them. And they're going to move on to either finding new ways to use those pieces. For instance, again, going back to that puzzle, they're going to use that little duck and they're going to make it do action things. And they're going to kind of go on to a new game, utilizing the pieces. But that idea and that function of putting that duck into the board and Mm -hmm. doing the puzzle, they've probably outgrown that already. Yeah, that's a great, what a great, great point. All right. Be, be very, very proactive up front in terms of looking at the age and getting ahead of the curve. There's so many companies that have come out as a result. I think Lovery is a pretty mm-hmm. well-known one that have these subscriptions almost on a monthly basis or their concept of rotation and having things ahead of the curve is important. But I also see a lot of research being done on the fact that kids sometimes love the keys and not the toys, or they love the remote and not the toys, right? Well, some folks are advocates of not necessarily having toys at home, but letting kids be have the more Montessori approach of playing with their natural environment, utensils, kitchen stuff, things like that. What do you feel as we are going to be talking now about at-home activities to 
help kids grow external toys versus our natural environment. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm 50-50. Honestly, <laughs> I, the previous type of work that I've done is in-home environment. And so I have worked with very low income families and I have worked with families with unlimited budgets. Um, and so I have found joy in working on speech and language skills with a Frito-Lays bag. You think that sounds silly, but I mean, we have amazing tools in our household of everyday objects to help kids learn. And that's what I think everyone is so excited about with all this like revamping of Montessori learning, Montessori toys, because it makes you really have to consciously decide like, do we need this toy or can we just use this found object to do this same skill? But I do think that there are some toys that are engineered in a way, like you can't beat a puzzle. You can't really beat some of those specific toys that are engineered to do little brain teasers. But as far as music production, you do not need to buy toys that make rain sounds or drums. Um, I recently learned that you can really easily break wooden spoons when banging them on pots. So make sure your tools are sturdy that you're offering to kids. But really, you know, if they see you using it, that's why they want to use it. You're on your phone all the time, that's why they want to touch your phone. They right. see the keys. You see the keys because mom and dad and caregivers are going, going, and your guys are doing errands and they see the keys. I mean, not everybody. I mean, Mike, see in my purse now, but a lot of value is added to these items and they're watching. I mean, this morning, my little one was watching me curl my hair and I know that she was paying attention and she was like, what is she doing? Why are you taking this object? But because mom has it, wow, it must have so much value. So I think it's really, I think it's really 50-50. Agreed, agreed. And, you know, we'll, of course, at home activities, nothing replaces that with parents, you engaging with your kids. I think that's mm -hmm. when they thrive. Um, that's their love language. So along those lines, what at home activities and items can parents use to promote their child's speech and language skills? What are some fun, engaging ways to encourage this verbal development. I think everybody knows about utilizing a blanket to play peekaboo, so we'll kind of move on beyond that. I'll give you some pro tips. Um, masking tape, painter's tape is so fun. You can literally just play with the tape. You can stick it on your nose, you can stick it on your cheeks, the little ones, depending on the different skill levels. You can talk about body parts. You can take it off of the body part and then you can do like a little peekaboo. It's sticky, there's a sensory element. I mean, you can toss the tape up. It's usually blue or green, it's like a fun <laughs> color. You can put it on your fingers and you can do sign language. I mean, a roll of painter's on. tape goes on yeah. a really long way. Another really great just kind of found object that pretty much everybody has is a cookie sheet. A lot of families have these stainless steels appliances and different things that they don't want kids to scratch. And so then they feel like, oh, I have to go out and get some type of like chalkboard that my kid can put magnets on. Cookie sheets. I can't tell you how many times the joy of a cookie sheet, you can bang on it, it becomes a musical instrument. Your tiny, tiny little newborns can kick it as a little footboard and it kind of makes a little sound and it's cold and so there's a lot of really good feedback. Another really good fun thing you can do with a cookie sheet is of course put magnets on it. We use it for water play too, so put water or dried rice, beans, different things and the little ones can be on their belly and they can kind of swim in it. <laughs> Gosh, so, sensory, yes. Yeah, lots of good sensory input comes from just good old baking sheets, cookie sheets. I always say to a family, like, do you have a magnetic cookie sheet? And they're like, well, aren't they all magnetic? And I was like, no, sometimes they're not. Oh, so make sure yeah. it's magnetic. <laughs> how fun, how fun. I wish I knew all of that as when I was a child. Um, right? And of course, you know, routines and schedules is important for us to be able to accommodate all these fun learnings. In general, I think it's important for nutrition, lactation, any part of growing up and learning experience, you know, probably routine and schedules come in that element as well. So is there a way parents can organize their day to optimize early learning experiences for their children? You know, what are some tips for integrating fun educational moments into the daily routines? So what a lot of people don't realize is that little ones' brains are primed 
for learning first thing in the morning. So they pop open their sweet little eyes and they are a sponge for four hours. After that, it's all downhill. And so a lot of people don't know that research really tells us like academic STEM learning, that is the best thing to do first thing in the morning. So depending on your child, depending on their age and what they're up to, you might want to vary your activities in different ways to really focus on STEM learning. So right, you can easily kind of look them up or you can utilize Ms. Poppins resources to figure out what are some good STEM learning, some good academic concepts to work on with your little one in the early morning hours. Uh, but then the rest of the day is a really good schedule to kind of follow this idea where we do arts and crafts and we go outside around kind of that snack, lunch time. That's usually when we're really creative, right? Music, Play-Doh if they're old enough, coloring if they're old enough, really getting into the more of that right brain learning. So we start with like left brain learning, really STEM, very academic. Then we switch our brains into that right brain learning where we're doing lots of creativity. This builds resiliency. This ultimately working on arts and crafts helps a child with self-esteem. It helps them learn to be more resilient. It helps those tantrums be a lot less. Families are like, hey, what do we do about these tantrums? I'm like, what kind of arts and crafts are we doing on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. How are we getting in there and making sure that they're building resiliency? Because if we're always just stacking things, we're always making sure that everything's perfect. And when do they have the time to not have something be perfect? And that really helps them balance. So after that arts and crafts time and we have that nap or we have that snack and lunch time, we can really move into freedom of movement. So that's really the best time that we're those movers and shakers, have a dance party, go for a walk, run an errand, get their little bodies move, move, moving. It helps combat that witching hour that happens when everyone comes mm -hmm. home from work at three or four o'clock and everyone's cranky. Everyone needs movement. So come home from work, turn on your music, have a dance party with your little ones. You know, if they're too little to dance themselves, hold them, dance. They love that. They need all that big movement. And then as things start to wind down, you can kind of do that bath, story time, and creating that really good sleep hygiene routine. But this just, this routine will set your kid up for the most optimal learning, optimal day, minimized tantrums. It really helps them just kind of feel like they've accomplished something you feel accomplished. I mean, it's sometimes really taxing because you're like, oh man, how do we accomplish all of that? But once you kind of chunk it and understand like, okay, these are the activities that we could do this week that are those freedom of movement. These are the places that we can go to get that freedom of movement, right? You can't always do it at home, that everyone wants to. You want to, sometimes you want to leave. And so just writing it down and having it kind of chunked out with, these are my ideas. Again, utilizing Ms. Poppins resources and getting that idea of, hey, this is what we could do for STEM activities. These are the activities for arts and crafts. These are the activities that are age appropriate for freedom of movement. These are, you know, some ideas on sleep hygiene and what we can do to set up this just optimal day. Wow, intriguing. The concept of four hours, I'm still very intrigued by that. Is that relevant to a certain age um, or a certain time frame for the kids or is that true through early childhood infancy to early childhood as far as what i know of the research it reflects all the way into that adolescent brain which is why you see the school districts all over the country little ones go to school earlier and the teenagers start to go later in the day um, mm -hmm. It's because of that change in their sleep and their brains. So good to know. Yes. While we're talking early childhood, you know, the, and we're talking, of course, creativity and the best time to optimize it. Let's talk about approaches, you know, the ways to do it. So as our last question for today, what would be some effective ways to foster problem solving, creativity skills in young children through play and daily activities? Wow, I feel like that question could go on for hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, how would we foster that creativity? I think that's a really good question in the sense that it comes down to 
the parent and how they like to play. That's one of the tips that I've always given for years. When I've trained people, when I've just trained moms and dads, how do you like to play? What did you play with as a child? Were you outside climbing trees? Were you kicking a soccer ball? Did you love to color and play dolls? Did you do a little bit of both? Were you the queen of arts and crafts? Did you always have glitter and glue everywhere? So how did they like to play? Because if the parent's not having fun, if they hate puzzles, if they don't like it, they're not gonna have that same joy, that same engagement as their kids are going to be enjoying and getting that language from you. If you're not genuinely smiling and having fun, and just a silly anecdote, like the other day, my husband was like playing with my daughter's giraffe for like a while. And like, he was having a great time with it because he loved stuffed animals when he was a kid more than I did. I wasn't really into my stuffed animals and dollies, but he did. He had this little stuffed monkey that he loved. And so he was really enjoying playing with the giraffe and therefore she was smiling and he was really getting into it. And so I think that's a huge piece of it is make sure you're having fun. We only have one life to live. So enjoy parenthood, but pick activities that you love and your little ones will love them too. Absolutely. And I think one other key tip I got, which I found and thrilling was, you know, you want to teach your kids so many things. Like we talked about problem solving creativity, but in your daily activities, you can do something like that. You know, you're in the kitchen and they can be counting strawberries because they like to cook and you're problem solving, you're teaching math through the concept of something they like to do, a activity you have to do as an adult inculcating this concept of math or some sort of creativity in, you know, in the kitchen through the whole thing. So that was another tip. I thought, wow, wonderful. Where, you know, we have to sit down on a table and really have to do a problem solving activity. There's so many different ways to go about doing it, including mm -hmm. as an adult and a parent and a caregiver, having fun yourself and being engaged. I think that's the love language of kids is parent interaction. And I think the more fun you're having, you're right. Absolutely. The, the better it is for our loved ones, our little ones. And with that, Laura, thank you so much for your tidbits and all of the great pointers. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you'd like to relate to our audience today? I would just love to say that kids are resilient. Moms and dads and caregivers are really hard on themselves. They have such multiple brains. And if you haven't been doing some of these things and you want to start doing them now, any time is a great time to start. Don't be so stuck on like, oh, well, we didn't expose those types of toys and we didn't do this. Now they're three or now they're four. It's okay. Honestly, it's just a great time to start enjoying interactions with your kids, exposing them to toys that are going to help them learn and really teach them new skills and just enjoy enjoy the journey together, honestly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us today on our journey for the podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. As we wrap up this special episode of Miss Poppins Art of Parenting, we want to express our heartfelt gratitude to Laura Austin, our incredible development coach. And to our listeners, we hope you found today's discussion on playful learning, shaping development through toys and activities very helpful. As you know, the choices we make in toys, activities, and routines significantly impact our child's development. By understanding these effects and consciously incorporating educational elements into play and everyday life, we can create an enriching environment that nurtures our child's growth, creativity, and learning abilities. Remember, every moment is an opportunity to inspire and shape young minds for a brighter future. We encourage you to put into practice the strategies and advice shared by Laura, and if you need further guidance, don't hesitate to reach out and download Ms. Poppins app where you can connect with our team of experts, including development, sleep, lactation, and many more coaches, all dedicated to helping you master the art of parenting. I'm your host, Nikki Rishi, signing off. Thank you.